somebody asked you what your favorite food is, what would you say? Do you have something, all of it? Do you have something in mind? When you talk about a favorite meal, do you have a meal that's really important to you? When you've had a long day, when you had trouble during COVID, how much comfort food did you have? When you think about food in your life, do you think about people in your life who are important to you and how you gather around a table together? How many of the important memories in your life have been built with friends around a table? Most of us, the really good things in life start around a table. The important moments of our lives are around a table. Do any of you have a recipe card that's so old that it's been passed down through your family that there are stains on the recipe card that you pull out every single year when you make that recipe? They're a part of your heritage. They're a part of your family. They're a part of your culture. They define you. They also connect you to who you are. Food's important to all of us. It grounds us. It centralizes us. It connects us. It's part of our culture. It's part of our family. For everyone. But for many, they don't have access to recipe cards or favorite meals or foods that they share with folks. They can't go out and have pizza and beer with friends at college. They struggle to make sure that they have basic food on their table. In fact, 35 million Americans today don't have steady access to food. 35 million Americans. Now, before you think about who those 35 million Americans, let me remove one group for you. It's not the folks on the corner who are asking you for money. Those folks are homeless. Important issue. But we're talking about 35 million Americans who are struggling with hunger. And what would you do if you or your family were hungry and you didn't have choices? How do you think you might handle that? If you're a parent and you had to choose between medicine and food for your child, which one would you choose? And more importantly, is that a choice that any human being should have to make? Yet there are 35 million Americans who are struggling with that issue today. And I would ask all of you, I would ask all of us to think about that circumstance that many find themselves in. So let's talk a little bit about what hunger is. Hunger is a physical state, right? We refer to people as hungry, but the reality is hunger is easily solved, right? If you're hangry, go get a Snickers bar, right? Hunger is solvable. You take in nutritious food, good calories, and you feel better. But there's a more insidious issue that's facing many of our friends and neighbors, and that's something we call food insecurity. It's a big term. It's actually a USDA term, right? So somebody's defined it at the government level. That generally tells us it's an important issue. And there are three main components to food insecurity that matter to all of us, especially to those 35 million Americans. First, it's chronic. That means you have an ongoing challenge in your life on a regular basis where you're unable to find food for yourself or for your family. So it isn't just today. We could all skip a meal today and be just fine. But there are folks that don't know on a regular basis where or when they're going to eat. And there are two other parts of the definition that matter to us. The first is the ability to access nutritious foods. Can you actually feed yourself and your family nutritious foods? One of the dirty secrets of food, and you all know this, is that unhealthy foods are cheaper. But can you feed you and your family nutritious foods? In fact, one of the things we often know is the United States is the only country in the world where malnourished kids are obese. Why? Because they're consuming unhealthy food. The other part of food insecurity that matters to us is the ability to acquire it in socially acceptable ways. What does that mean? Most of us acquire food in a socially acceptable way, don't we? We go in, we sit down at the restaurant, we order our meal when we're done, we pay for our food, we don't dine and dash, right? When we go to the grocery store, we select the items that we want, that we care about, that we're gonna feed our families with, and we pay for those. 
That is the way transactions should occur. That is the way we should all acquire food. But for people who are chronically food insecure, they don't have the same options. So they resort to other ideas, other methods. You have folks that will sell possessions for food. Again, imagine that, that you're in a position where you have to sell something that's valuable to you in order to feed your family. We have people who report to us on a regular basis, they actually sell plasma to feed themselves, their family, or in the worst instances, their children. And a few years back, we did a study in Pinellas County here in Florida where we studied high school kids who are an area, a group of folks who are generally food insecure and at greatest risk. We studied some of the different issues that were going on with high schoolers who are food insecure, and we found a couple of different things that were important to us and heartbreaking to us. The first is virtually all of the children that we talked to reported at some point stealing food in order to feed themselves because they told us, I have younger siblings, so I'm not going to eat at home. I don't want to take food from them. These are high schoolers having to make this decision. And they don't tell their parents because they don't want to upset them. We also found out that kids would steal stuff, sell it, and feed themselves. In fact, this problem was so chronic in the areas that we studied that many shopkeepers would not allow high school kids in their stores after school because they knew they were going to steal. That's how chronic it was. And in one particularly galling instance, we heard from three or four different children who reported to us that they were trading sexual favors for food. This is a study done by USF. So what happens when people are food insecure? For children, oftentimes, they are fed at school, breakfast, lunch, snacks. And when they don't have enough food at nights, weekends, and summers, they struggle. Education issues become significant. Behavioral problems start to arise. And it's a perfect storm for a child to struggle as an adult. For families who struggle with food insecurity, you see significant instability in their household because they're making choices between do I pay rent, do I pay for gas, or do I get food for my family? And what happens when families are unstable is they become unreliable colleagues, employees. They're unable to keep jobs. They end up in a significant financial turmoil. Seniors who struggle with food insecurity, right? We go into our golden years, we're going to retire, we're ready to settle in. Well, what happens to seniors? Generally, when a senior retires and they rely on something like Social Security, they settle into their golden years all ready to live out their lives, and then they find, wait a minute, Social Security staying the same, but the cost of my groceries keeps escalating far beyond it. So what does a senior do? What does a grandparent do? They go from three meals a day to two. And then they go from two meals a day to one. And you know what happens with that one meal? Is a lot of seniors, guess what they have? Pets. And you know what they tell us? We'll feed our pet before we feed ourselves because they're our companion. In fact, food banks today give out pet food knowing that seniors need to feed their pets. Seniors will also tell us that they have to make a choice between medicine and food. And here's what they do. They choose half of both which renders both ineffective. And again, the question I think all of us have to ask ourselves is in the most prosperous nation in the United States, why do people have to make these choices? And more importantly, I think for all of us, we have to realize that the folks that are in this circumstance are not them. They're us. They're our friends. They're our neighbors. They're our coworkers. They're folks that we employ for services in our lives. Every single one of us in this room today knows someone who is struggling to put food on their table. Every single one of us. Let me give you a couple of examples that I've run across. The first is a couple of years ago, I was doing a food distribution with a 
couple of friends that uh, were helping volunteer with us, as often happens. And on my right was a senior executive of a large retail grocery chain. On my left was one of his managers. A car would pull up, we'd open a door, we'd put the food in the box of the food into the car, and off the car would go. We do this car after car after car. Car pulls up, we open the door, we put the box of food in the car, and the manager to my left says, nice to see you, Janice, and Janice says hi. And off Janice drives. Guy on my right, the senior executive, says, how do you know Janice? And you can see the store manager looking down at his feet. He said, well, she's one of our employees. Another instance is one time I'm serving food to folks who are coming into a restaurant-style opportunity to sit down and eat, and I'm doing it with some high school kids. And high school kids are feeding, and someone comes in and gets food and sits down. You can see the kids talking to each other, right? They're doing that. So I went over and I said, what's going on? And they said, that's one of our teachers. So these are folks that we're entrusting with the education of our children, and they're struggling to put food on their table. What do we think is going to happen as a result of that? And let me give you one last example of this. Every single one of us has a patriotic bone in our body, don't we? We stand up and we salute the flag. We stand proud and tall. We talk about the importance of folks that stand bravely on walls and guard and protect our basic freedoms that we enjoy and appreciate. Well, 20% of them are coming to us to get food. Active and retired military showing up at food banks to feed themselves. Was that the deal we made with them when we asked them to stand on a wall for us? Everybody good with that? So I don't want my talk to be hopeless. I want it to be hopeful. And so as we think about this, first, we need to understand that it is them who is food insecure, who is hungry. Excuse me, it's us, not them, who is food insecure and hungry. And I believe that once we understand it is us, we will have a sense that we want to get involved because everybody wants to help a neighbor and a friend. We all want to be a part of something positive. More importantly, I believe fundamentally that service to another is not an opportunity. As a food bank and a volunteer-based organization, I can't tell you how many times somebody says, hey, I really appreciate the opportunity to volunteer. It's not an opportunity, it's a fundamental responsibility. Every human being has had someone help them at some point in their lives. Whether it's parents that paid for education, a friend that stood with you during the loss of someone, whether it's somebody that loaned you money at your lowest point, every single one of us has had help. And if we have all had help, then we have the responsibility to help another. And the good thing about that responsibility to each other is that's where hope starts. That's where change happens. The other thing that we contemplate uh, that is hopeful is this. It's the power of one. It's the power of you. And let me tell you one last story about that. I work as a food bank, at a food bank, one of the largest in the United States. But I want to tell you how food banking started. There's a guy named John Van Hengel who lived in Phoenix, Arizona in the late 60s and early 70s. And John was volunteering, helping his community by trying to feed people. And John, during one of his days of service, ran across a mother with 10 children who was coming in for food. 10 kids, no exaggeration. John had a conversation with her and said, hey, when you're not here getting food, how do you feed your children? And she said, well, you know, they're throwing away perfectly good food into the dumpsters behind restaurants and grocery stores, so I dive into those dumpsters and I get food out and I feed my kids. Right? John recalls that he was so taken by this moment he couldn't think of anything else. But she looks at him and she says, you know, that's perfectly good food. Somebody ought to get that and bring it to a place like St. Mary's Church here in Phoenix. And then it could be like a food bank and I could come get the food there. John said, that I can do. And John started the first food bank, St. Mary's Food Bank in Phoenix, Arizona, that still exists today. And today, there are 200 food banks across the United States. And last year, we provided close to 5 billion meals to folks who would otherwise not have had a meal. But the story that's important there is the power of one, because John didn't look at that and say, that's her problem. She's them. John said, she's us. 
She's a part of my community. She's someone that I have a responsibility to, and I'm going to stand up and step in. So what can you do? If you think that it's us, what can you do? Get involved. Step up and stand in. Our communities need all of us to have a sense of responsibility to each other and to the well-being of our community. I'm a New Jersey kid, so my poet laureate of rock and roll is Bruce Springsteen. <laughs> Can't help it. Love the guy. I was at a concert in the mid-'80s, and Bruce goes through the whole concert, and it, towards the end of it, he stops, and he starts talking to the audience, and he's talking about the local food bank that he was volunteering at and how important it was that we support the local food bank. I didn't even know what a food bank was. Right? And Bruce said at the end of it, you know, please make sure you help out. Go volunteer, give some money, but make sure your friends and neighbors can eat. And he finished with this. Because unless everybody wins, nobody wins. Let's make sure everybody wins. Thank you. <laughs>